Welcome to week two of The Great Decisions. Um, we've had a lot of questions from folks about the YouTube. The YouTube is where we uh, take these talks and post them after the fact. Um, and our dear, dear friends at Campus AV were a little short-staffed, so we have not posted um, last week's, but we should have it up next week in case you missed it or you thought it was so rockin' that you want to send it on to somebody else. But generally, um, know that there is a little bit, uh, probably like a week lag time before I get it up and running. Um, and then, I mean, part of that was, we've got this little uh, show that we put on called the International Speaker Series, which started this week. How many of you heard Samantha Power the other night? What did you think? Pretty darn smart. Um, so coming up in the series, um, on February 19th, we will have General H.R. McMaster, which should be a fascinating talk considering everything we're seeing in the world around our current administration. Um, and just to let you know, individual tickets for the series are going to go on sale uh, February 13th. So if you bought the series, you're set. Um, if you're gonna be picky and only go to a couple of them, February 13th is the date that you wanna mark in your calendar. Um, and in fact, you buy on the 13th, you can give it to your sweetie on the 14th for Valentine's Day. Um, out front, we've got a schedule of all the things coming up uh, in the Great Decision Series. Uh, this is also available online at worldoregon.org. It is a very wonderful series. I mean, I always say this every year. This is one of my very, very favorite things that I get to do. Uh, many of you I have seen for years. This is the 10th year that I've been here doing this. And it never gets old, it never gets tired. And it is amazing to me that week after week, people come in regardless of the topic because they just want to connect and know more. So um, give yourselves a big hand there. If you don't have the book yet, we've got the book out front. If you're a member, it's $32. If you're not a member, it's 35. You might as well just become a member and save throughout the year. So there's my pitch for membership. Um, coming up, uh, by the way, see that up there? That is the cover of the very first Great Decisions book from the 1953 program here at Portland State University. We have been doing this program since 1953, and um, it's pretty exciting because we're going into our 70th anniversary, so we're looking back a lot at, at uh, things we've done, where we've been, what, uh, what our origin story was, if you're going to be you know, in superhero speak. And... Um, it was really great to get a copy of that, and, and um, it was from Charlie White. Charlie White, you're not here, are you? He, come, he still comes to the program. He's probably about 92 now. Um, anyway, coming up, we've got some great things. This has been scrolling through. Um, new this year, our friends at Umbria have generously donated free coffee. Um, let's give a big shout and an applause to Umbria. Uh, coming up this Sunday, our young professionals do a really wonderful program called Long Reads Club. It's at the Rose City Book Pub on Fremont, right around the corner from the new from the Whole Foods on 15th. And every other Sunday, 11.30 to 1, they pick a piece of long-form journalism, and they invite people to read it, come in, and talk about it. And this week, it is going to be, this is this Sunday, it's going to be on Conflict Chocolate and the child labor situation in the cocoa business, which is a very, very big deal. There's also an organization in town called the Never Again Coalition that is doing a whole month-long series on conflict chocolate. Uh, so we're doing this in conjunction with their program, which is designed to raise awareness that all the major manufacturers that we know and love, like Mars, Hershey, Cadbury, are employing child labor. So it kind of puts a damper on your Halloween, but you know what? We gotta keep it real. Anyway, also coming up uh, next week, Tim Boyle, uh, CEO of Columbia Sportswear, is going to be talking about free trade and global engagement. He has been doing a lot of interviews. He has been doing a lot of op-ed pieces about this. It's gonna be at the Old Church. We're really looking forward to that. Columbia has been a great partner for World Oregon. Also, Karen Sherman, uh, who, went, who actually went to school here in Oregon, and founded the first women's college in Rwanda is gonna be speaking on February 12th with Lisa Shannon. If you're not familiar with Lisa Shannon, she founded Run for Congo 
and for many years was based here in Portland, doing a lot of uh, really fantastic activism. She's now based in Seattle, but they're going to be in conversation, and we're looking forward to that as well. A reminder, we are streaming this, so when we get around to the Q&A, and I had that little handy thing up there about how to ask a question. Um, if you want to ask a question, it's imperative that people do it on the mic, and I will be running around afterwards with the mic, doing a little Montel Williams. Oh, here we are. This is how to ask a question. It is 30 seconds or less. It has a question mark. <laughs> anyway, um, on to today's program. I'm excited today to have with us Elliot Levine. Elliot uh, is at Mercy Corps. Mercy Corps, as you well know if you've come to these programs, is a longtime uh, community partner of ours, and we love working with them. In fact, their interim CEO is on our board, and they are one of those wonderful organizations in our community that reminds us why it's important to care and connect to things outside of ourselves. So thank you all. Um, Elliot is a climate change and environmental expert with 19 years of experience in international development and conservation. He's currently the director of Mercy Corps' Environmental Technical Support Unit, leading a team of technical advisors providing strategic support to Mercy Corps' global program portfolio as related to climate change, adaptation, disaster risk reduction, low carbon development, natural resource management, et cetera. Prior to Mercy Corps, he spent eight years working at the World Wildlife Fund as a senior climate adaption advisor. In this role, he worked directly with WWF's country and field teams to increase their capacity to integrate climate risks into their conservation strategies while supporting the development of technical tools and approaches such as vulnerability assets. And if those all sound like really long 25 cent words, what he's going to do is tell you what all that means and why you should care. So let's have a big hand for Elliot Levine. All right. I was told to press the button. I think I just had to press like five times. And it was probably, I was not pressing it hard enough. Um, so thanks everyone for, for having me here. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Tim said, I, I work for Mercy Corps. And so I get to do a lot of international travel for, for them. In fact, even before when I was at World Wildlife Fund, WWF in DC for 10 years, I did all international work for them as well. And so while I get to talk to a lot of people about climate change um, and environment and natural resource management and all these issues that we care a lot about, I never really get to do it in places that I live with people that I live around. So it's really nice to be doing something here in Portland. It's really nice to see everyone coming out and I just appreciate getting the opportunity to talk to you all. So thank you. Um, before I jump into the, the, the bits of this talk, I wanna give you all just a little bit of context for where my perspective is coming from. And I think it, I, I'm pretty sure you all know Mercy Corps, but just so you, to make sure we're all on the same page as what we do here is, we're, we're a pretty large organization now. We're about 5,000 strong. Um, and we, we work in over 40 countries at this point. And one thing I think is that's really important to recognize about, about Mercy Corps is that when we say we, we're 5,000 strong and we work in 40 countries, the 5,000 strong is not people that, that look like myself. Um, there are people who have grown up in the countries that we're working in. There are people who have lived there most of their entire lives and are now working to try to better and develop the places in which they work. And I got some really great experiences when I first joined Mercy Corps, actually, of walking around a village with, um, in northern Kenya with one of my colleagues who had been there about a year, and she introduced me to her cousin. And which I found fascinating when I first started working there is that this woman who's from this village is now working to help the place that she was from and is introducing me to her family members. It kind of hit home for me when I first joined. Um, in terms of what we do, I think a lot of people see, if you're on Facebook or the internet, you probably see ads and emails from us. You probably get stuff that says, you know, requests for help and acknowledgement of big disasters and emergency events. And for sure, we do quite a bit of work as sort of emergency and humanitarian response. And we may be well known for that stuff. But we're also embedded in these places, these 40 countries or so, for really long periods of time in many cases. Sometimes it's because of, of a big disaster, a disastrous event, a really big storm, a flood, a drought. These kings can cause us to set foot in those countries, 
But then we get anchored in and we start doing work because we realize the sort of longer term need. So we work on everything from food security, education, we do stuff on um, job training and livelihoods. We work on health and wellness. Um, we work on, I like to see that we, on our stock slide, we have water and environment up there. Um, so we do quite a bit of, of work as an organization in addition to some of the emergency response and humanitarian stuff. So, so with that context, we see the sort of on the ground situation quite a bit. And I, I want to make sure that I'm starting with that because I know um, as part of this series, you all get a reading um, that you all read before you come in, come in here. Um, I'm, I'm hoping most of you have read it. Tim tells me yet mostly everyone reads them. Um, and I know it was called Climate Change and Global Order. Um, I thought it was a really interesting article in foreign policy. And, but it, it didn't explore one side that I was hoping it would explore. So the article I felt was really good at summing up sort of the macro trends that are happening, the relationships between big, powerful countries, the economics of it, the sort of historical context of climate policy, in terms of what that means for us as a, as a, as a global community to be able to deal with climate change and figure out a plan forward. What it didn't do, though, is bring out what I think is really important for us not to take for granted, which is how local dynamics in some of the most vulnerable countries of the world also will play a huge role in that. And so what I'm hoping to explore today with you guys is a little bit around this concept of climate change and fragility. Climate change, and I'll define these things as we get started here, climate change is, I'm sure, a concept that many of us understand. We might not have like a strict definition in our head, but we sort of understand what it is, right? It's changing of our climate at a national, regional, or global level. And when we say climate, that can be a hard thing to understand, but we would mostly feel climate change in terms of how our weather is changing from day to day. Did the rainy season in Portland start earlier and later than it normally does? Does it last as long? Are our summers hotter than they used to be? These are the things that we feel. Or maybe we see larger storm events, um, more extreme events as we would call them. Some people just call it climate weirding as a way of explaining all the various possible things that can happen. Um, and then there's this, this other word up here, fragility. So fragility means a lot of different things. The way we think about it is Mercy Corps, um, if we're gonna break it down in, into really easy terms, it's just two kind of key factors. The first one is it, it, it describes a context in where the governing capacity of that country or the governments within that country are, is fairly weak. So they're either fairly corrupt as a country and the government is not responsive to the people that it's, it's supposed to be working to serve, or it potentially for some reason or another, they're unable to, to provide that service. And so it's really important that we understand how, as we talk about how we're gonna prepare as a global community to deal with the impacts of climate change, we have to recognize that not everyone is on the same playing field. There's a huge difference between countries in Europe and countries in East, Southern, Western Africa, and many of the places that, that I get to work in, my colleagues at Mercy Corps get to work in every day. And the degree to which a country is fragile or, or has those problems with governance is a, real in, is a really significant factor. The other thing I left out when I described governance, the other factor, uh, sorry, the other factor in that, that fragility word is conflict. So it's the governance piece, and then if you're a fragile context, you also have a high risk of conflict breaking out at any point in time. Often, these are places that have had years of conflict happening, and there's high potential for it to, to start again, or it's already occurring as we speak. And so we like to think of this, we like to think of this as, a, as a loop, climate change and fragility being related to one another. So on one hand, if we start from this side on climate change, we have that the effects of climate change can make a context more fragile. So a thing like a drought or a flood can weaken the relationship between a society and government. So let's say you're in northern Kenya where I was describing earlier, and you're already not so thrilled with the government. They haven't been providing you with services. You don't feel like they're protecting your family and your friends and your community by providing information on when a, when a drought may be occurring so you know when, when to plant. Um, and you, 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 there's definitely a, a set of grievances that you're feeling. Climate change, increasing those droughts, increasing the frequency of challenging seasonal occurrences, can 
increase your grievances even more, can make you more and more upset. It can also strain relationships between you and your, and your neighbors and your community members, making you compete for resources amongst one another instead of cooperating and sharing with one another. That all makes things more fragile. It reduces how much people are, are working with their government, and it reduces the connectivity, or what we call social cohesion, between communities, their neighbors, their family members. On the other hand, though, fragile contexts, these conflict-affected, low-governance places, make it really, really hard for, for places to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So think about it. If you are a pastoralist in Uganda, and your job is to roam the, roam the, um, roam the landscape and follow rain, wherever rain goes so you can have good grazing land, how are you supposed to do that if there's armed conflict? You can, there, there are massive restrictions on people in these places that do not allow them to adapt with a changing climate. And the more fragile a context, the more, the, the more limitations they have to deal with. So here's, to bring that down to reality, here's a, here's, uh, this is DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo, if you guys know anything about Congo, has, been, has had years of conflict, years of conflict. And if you fly over Congo, and I actually think this picture does a good job, you see pretty much this. You see roaming, rolling hillsides of what used to be a forest. And now, what is it? It's agricultural fields and deforested areas. The big, one of the big reasons for this is that there haven't been policies or laws in place around land security. And so the incentive for you as a farmer in a conflict-affected space where you don't know if you're going to have land the next year is to maximize that land as much as possible without thinking about the sustainability of those resources at all. So you, 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 you uh, farm that land as much as you can, intensively as you can, you reduce the soil quality, and then you expand some more into a new plot of land, deforesting that area beforehand. And that goes on for years and years and years, and all of a sudden you have a landscape where people are actually fighting over the, left, the land left available, and which is the current uh, situation that we're trying to deal with and program around in, in DRC. And so you have a situation now where people are, are fighting over this land. Now you add on top of that climate change, decreasing rain, annual amounts of rainfall, rising temperatures in these places. Still the same land security problems, still the same conflict problems. What are people in DRC supposed to do about how to adapt to climate change? They have very limited options, much less options than someone who has access to insurance to protect their crops, who has secure access to land, who knows that next year if I farm my land well this year and maintain the nutrients in the soil, that I'll have it next year and I'll do better next year because they can trust it. So I'm gonna plant those crop resist, those climate res smart crops as we call them now. So DRC is a great example of a place that's both highly climate change vulnerable and highly fragile at the same time. So question for you all. What percentage of countries do you think in the world that rate highly vulnerable to climate change also rank really high in terms of fragility? All right, let's say both. Raise your hand if it's 45. Got a couple. 63? 72. All right, I kind of stacked the deck a little bit on that. <laughs> It would have been really disappointing if I said 45. It's really not all that interesting. We can all sit down and go home, right? Um, so it's 72%. So just to put that in perspective, that encompasses 3.4 billion people in 78 countries. 3.4 billion people live in the most highly vulnerable to climate change countries and are also living in contexts of high conflict and low ability of government to govern. That's the capacity of which we're talking about when we say we're trying to manage for the impacts of climate change. That's the, that's the challenge. So to bring that down a little bit more, I, I want to show you a quick video from some work that a group at Adelphi did around climate change and conflict dynamics. And this takes place in the Lake Chad River Basin. Oh. Hold on. I have to end my slideshow. There we go. Thanks.
So the reason, I'm, the reason I showed that video is because I think it's a really good example of what we're just kind of talking about, that links between climate change and climate change and, and fragility, right? I mean, the, the people they were talking about in the video could have had adaptation options, but they're restricted by military, uh, military restrictions um, and other factors. Um, and those same things were in that region, I know, at least con also contributing to climate change. In many of the cases, if you can't adapt, what do you do? You start to destroy the environment. You start to use up the resource. You start to use up as many resources as you can around you. Oftentimes, what that means in many of the places we're working is deforestation, which only furthers climate change by not allowing the forest to sink up the carbon dioxide that it normally would, thus contributing to greenhouse gas and warming of the planet. So it's all interrelated. The question is, where are we headed? Is this a situation that's going to continue? Can we expect some reprieve from it in some way, shape, or form? Um, and I'm fairly certain you guys know where I'm going with this, which is it's not going to get any easier in particular. Um, I think that the one report that I look back on that is most impactful, and so much has been written about this, but in 2018, the report that made me like shudder the most was this report by the IPCC, which is just a governing panel of scientists who come together and study climate change from all over the world. They're at universities like this. And they're organized to put out these scientific reports on the state of climate change. And what this report looked at was um, the differences between hitting 1.5 degrees change in temperature and uh, 2, point, uh, 2 degrees rise in temperature in terms of climate change. Um, traditionally, we all thought that hitting 1.5 degree change would be further off 
The report found that we're actually much closer than we thought, roughly 11, potentially 11 years, and that some of the most damaging effects of us hitting that point are roughly in 11 years. The thing that made, for me, the most challenging about it is that the negative impacts of hitting an, a, one point, a rise in 1.5 degrees of global temperatures was much more severe than any other climate change report had articulated. And what was interesting, if you read a lot of these things, is the scientific community tends to be fairly conservative. They're not doomsdayers. They do not overestimate these things. In fact, most of the climate models, if you look at the reports, of them trying to predict what the future will be have come up conservative when we look back at the predictions. And so if you read these reports and you hear how straightforward, direct, and challenging they are, you take pause. So if you ever want to have a really tough afternoon, you can read this report. Um, but what it ultimately leads you to believe or, or to understand based on really good science is that we're going to hit 1.5 degrees and which will result in some really challenging impacts in the world, including 100 million more people being in poverty, as an estimate, and a much higher um, amount of food insecurity around the world. And we know that these are drivers of conflict and fragility. These contribute to those situations. So it's not something we're going to be able to get away from. So how do we deal with it? Well, the only real option we have is to dig in and do hard work and build climate resilience in, in these places. And that's going to take some pretty challenging new solutions that we haven't tried before. Um, I'm going to give you a couple examples of things that we're involved in that I think give me a lot of hope that we can do this work if the right investments are made in what we're doing. Um, so, but just to, before I jump in, just to give you a sense of what we're trying to do here, is that there's, in a perfect world, this is how development would work, what we do at Mercy Corps would work, where over time, there'd be an investment of money from the donor community in terms of increasing well-being. And we would see as Mercy Corps, as other NGOs begin to dig in and do the good work in places around the world, we'd see well-being go up. That would be perfect. That would be in an ideal world. In reality, our work in our world and our context looks a lot more like this, where we make some sort of progress than a massive drought or a flood or a storm happens, and we see a lot of damage and a lot of loss in well-being, and we sometimes we start over. And if you look at the trends, there's been a lot of waste in development dollars because we're not adequately taking into account for years how to deal with these shocks and stresses, as we call them. How do we deal with these extreme events that cause a loss in well-being? And so this is where this idea of resilience comes in. And we, you know, that word resilience is thrown around a lot these days, but really what it means is that as we're doing development work, as we're helping to build communities up, build their economies up, build their livelihoods up, we're doing so in a very purposeful way that accounts and just assumes that bad stuff is going to happen, that a drought's going to occur because it has occurred for every year for the last 10 years. That, that uh, five-year flood that communities were, uh, knew was going to happen is now going to happen every year. And so how do we change our tactics to deal with that? So I want to give you guys... What I want to talk about are what I think are some bold, innovative solutions that, that need to be scaled up and taken into account if we're actually going to address this stuff. Um, now, I'm going to give you examples from Mercy Corps. And Tim gave me one piece of advice when I was doing this talk. Do not make this an ad for Mercy Corps. And that is absolutely not my intention. In fact, I, I'll just be upfront and honest. These solutions are hard. We have not been perfect with this stuff. It is challenging. Some of the, the stuff I'll talk about is the latest iteration of things we've been trying to do for a while. Some of these are pilots that we're still working on, but these are the things that when I look up at our portfolio of programs, these are the things that like, give me hope that I think we're going about doing this the right way, and that others who are trying these same things and having similar success are also, also doing it the right way, and collectively, you know, this lets us know we're going down the right path. So, the first area I think we need to do work on is climate finance. Now, we can't invest in adaptation work if we aren't funding it well. Climate finance really just refers to funding that is specifically dedicated to deal with climate change. And there is a lot of it, trillions of dollars of it. However, it is locked up in something like this. 
This is the world of climate finance. Each one of these acronyms, these letters up here, represents a different institution with different rules, different amounts of money, different programs, different application processes. It is relentlessly hard, even for a global organization like Mercy Corps, to get money from these institutions to do this type of work. Now imagine if you are the government of Uganda. The amount of paperwork, logistic, financial systems you have to have in place to do this is incredible. I can tell you that word right there, GCF, it's called the Green Climate Fund. We have had our application in with the Green Climate Fund for over two years. I know because I wrote the first version of it. And we're still dealing with them to get climate finance. So one of the number one things we can do is help to get those funding that sits in these banks, that sits in these institutions, down to the people you saw in those videos. And that's a hard challenge to do. The reason, and it's important, though, that we, we get that right. So just a couple of facts that will help ground this. Developing countries currently are estimated uh, to be responsible to bear 75 to 80 percent of the cost of climate change at this point. In, two, in 2017 to 2018, there was a $150 billion gap in the need for adaptation financing at the country level. And of all those institutions and all that money that they had, only 11% of that money is actually making it to the ground. So of all that trillions of dollars sitting in all those institutions and in all those banks, only 11% is making it there. And of that 11%, only a fraction of that is making it into the most fragile, riskiest places to invest it. So the best thing we can do is find a way to, one, make this number go up to like 80 to 100%, and make sure it's getting to the places that absolutely most critically need it the most. We have had some successes in doing this. In Kenya, we had a program that was funded by the UK government called BRACED. It was called, so we love our acronyms in this world. BRACE stands for Building Resilience to Adaptation, Climate Extremes and Disasters. Talk about a mouthful, <laughs> right? So we had this program called BRACED. Um, it was in northern Kenya, very, very, um, very difficult place to work, pastoralist, imagine pretty desert-like um, atmosphere of people roaming cattle and camels around this landscape to graze them, to find water, and then to eventually take them to market and then sell them off for, for food to support their families. Um, the national government of Kenya has a national adaptation fund for climate support. They get that money from some of those international funds I put up there on that big graph. The challenge is none of that money actually reaches the ground. So we went out to find a way to try to do that. So we worked in the county of Wajir in northern Kenya, which is a fairly large county that has had lots of complex problems in the past, including conflict. When I was there about a month after, the supermarket was blown up because of two warring fractions. And we helped work with the county government to do all the vulnerability assessments they needed to to understand what their climate risks were. And we helped them build their budgetary, financial, and managerial systems in the county government to be able to actually apply for those funds. And then we built their capacity to then fill out all the application forms and paperwork and all the stuff that doesn't sound all that sexy, frankly, but is in order to make sure that that county government can request funds from, the national, from that national institution who holds that money. And we got it, it worked. Money flowed from the national government, which came from an international entity, down to the local government and started supporting the efforts outlined in the vulnerability assessment. From what we understand, this is one of the first sort of what's called like decentralized climate finance schemes in all of Africa, meaning money actually flowed from all these institutions down to local people who actually needed it. And our job now is to replicate that. And that's what we're doing in other counties around Kenya, and we're trying to expand it into Ethiopia and others. So there's a nice methodology that's building up around that. But this is one example, and it needs to be scaled up, it ne we need to find other methods that work in other countries with other systems of government that have whole different processes. But it's a big problem, and I think this is one that we need to solve. The other one that we need to solve is around climate-smart agriculture. That basically refers to, um, climate-smart agriculture basically refers to agricultural practices that are both good for the environment and recognize um, that climate shocks and stresses are going to occur and kind of take those into account in terms of agricultural design, crop selection, other things like that. One of the things that needs to happen if we're 
if we're going to do this, is we need to start to focusing on using technology in, these, in the application of climate smart agricultural techniques. And the reason this is so important is that because globally, nine out of 10 farmers are considered to be just relatively smallholder farmers, which means they don't own a lot of land, they don't have a lot of resources. But that's nine out of 10 farmers globally. That means the bulk of the world is being fed by small farmers with a plot of land, a small plot of land and not that many resources. Millions of people rely on them for their food every day. And yet agriculture is probably the, one of the most vulnerable livelihoods in the world. There's a guy named Josh Busby who's a famous climate vulnerability assessment guru. He wrote an article for Foreign Policy magazine not that long ago that looked at the factors of what leads to the most climate vulnerable places. And one of the indicators of climate vulnerability, the top one, was whether or not you're an agricultural dependent society or not. So if we can't get agriculture right, and if we can't get it right through the use of technology for smallholder farmers, then we're in trouble. So there's a couple of good examples from this. The first comes from Mongolia. And in Mongolia, this is pretty much what it looks like. Roaming hillsides, um, oftentimes a lot snowier than this. When I, when I flew into Mongolia for the first time, it looked like an entire other planet. It was gorgeous and gray and covered in snow and rolling hillsides in a way that I had not ever seen before. And people make their living on, in very remote places, um, in very remote places. In fact, they have the opposite problem of many places that have density issues in big cities. They have sparsity issues. People are just not connected. They don't have ways of communicating with one another. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a woman named Alton, right there on the left, and her family. They were a pastoralist family, like, like millions of others in Mongolia, um, for, for many, many years. And like many herders, you know, they have a deep sense of the place they work. They've been there for years. They understand the systems. However, there's a, there's a weather phenomenon called Zud, D-Z-U-D, in Mongolia. It's not used outside of Mongolia. And it's used to describe a very unique combination of a drought happening in the summer, followed by a really brutal winter. So it's a combination. And they actually give them colors. It's really cool. So there's a white zod, a black zod, a green zod. And they're all different uh, sort of nuances on, on what that is. And the zods have become far worse than they ever have been in Mongolia, um, which has resulted in a ton of cattle die off. Um, and frankly, Alton and her family, the woman in that photo and her entire family, left pastoralism. They went and tried to get jobs in the cities. They couldn't make it work any longer, like many of them. One of the big reasons was lack of information technology. Cell phones weren't cutting it. They weren't being able to get connected. They didn't have the information to make a choice about what they should be investing in, where they should take their cattle, what they should do seasonally. So one of the programs that, that we tried to set up was what we were calling an advanced weather system for Mongolia. Frankly, Alton and her family had no way of even like pulling out a phone and checking out what the weather is. We all get on our phones, we look at what the weather is gonna be that, that morning and we decide what we're gonna wear, what we might wanna eat, what we're gonna do with our day. They have no sense of being able to get that information. So Mercy Corps worked with a whole host of different tech partners to develop a way for Mongolians anywhere in Mongolia to get access to weather, early warning and cattle grazing information based on their exact geographic location. And we did it actually through using a lot of technology that's already available. Do you guys, does anyone here on their, their uh, cell phone have a, an app called Dark Skies? Yeah, I do too, it's great. It tells you the weather based on where you are. So if I'm in my house in North Portland, the weather's different than in Southwest, I know it's raining in Southwest but not where I am and I can go for my run. Um, but I know not to go to Southwest. That's what this will do. This will give her and her family uh, weather information based on where she is. You also get grazing information and market information based on where you are. So you can actually make an informed decision. And you will get early warning information. So Mercy Corps worked with app developers and tech developers to utilize existing apps and then develop early warning systems and other things that could also be integrated and put on top of that app and used. That's one really good example. And now, Based on that, and the popularity of it, and the willing to pay for it, the government took it from us, and the national cell phone company is now supporting it, and it's now just an institutionalized thing. It's done. It's no longer Mercy Corps. It's out of our hands. It's with the national government and the private sector now, and they're just scaling it because they've realized people are willing to pay for it, and pay for it repeatedly over and over and over again to use it. 
And so Alton and her family, actually, this is them after they started using the service, and they're, they're back in action. They're back to pastoralist livelihoods. Um, and they're a part of a growing community actually using all this stuff. I, for the sake of time, am going to skip over, unfortunately, um, one other thing on, on uh, this sort of tech-enabled um, ag, but, I, but there's a whole lot of work going on in that space, and I think it's really important that we begin to look at the use of technology in agriculture. And Mercy Corps, I think one of the things I like about our ag work is that it is starting to explore the use of mobile technology to distribute money, to distribute knowledge, to link farmers to farmers, to link farmers to producers. Um, you can think of it as almost like Uber for your farm goods. Like if, my, if I've um, harvested my crop for the year, I can let through the app know that I've harvested my crop and I want someone to purchase it and so people will come and purchase it, instead of having to travel really, really far to a center that may or may not have a buyer. The last area I want to talk about before closing up is what I would call innovative disaster risk reduction. So DRR has disaster risk reduction, or DRR as a lot of people use that acronym, it's been done for a really long time. There's nothing really innovative about preparing for disastrous events. However, in our world, a lot of that work happens at a community, at a very small community scale, community by community, without looking at the sort of root causes of some of the challenges. Um, and it's done without link thinking about the long-term sustainability of how to ensure it's economically sustainable to maintain those interventions in the long term when Mercy Corps steps back from a program and sees how, how things evolve over time. <clears throat> one of the programs that I want to, one of the approaches that I want to highlight to you is beginning to look at sort of river basin-wide disaster risk reduction efforts. And so one of the number one challenges around disasters around the world is flooding. In fact, we have whole programs and teams that just work on flooding issues. One of the more significant efforts we had on this was in Indonesia, where we were working in, in a city called Samarang for many years on flooding and climate change. And we couldn't we, we, we worked there for a number of years organizing city government officials to do assessments and to understand how to budget properly for climate change interventions and all of that. But we realized we weren't actually solving the root cause of the problem, which is the flooding was coming from upstream in the river basin. And if we never solve those upstream environmental management problems with the way the river basin was being managed, no matter what we did at that city level, it was just going to keep flooding every year after every year after every year. So what we started to do was through a program that we called Transform, was to pull together all of the actors across the entire river basin, did a number of assessments with them and technical groups that we brought together to understand exactly why is the flooding occurring and why is it not just happening at the city level, but actually to all the small towns and villages along that river and to bring a sense of cooperation amongst them. So first, you know, we started on making sure that everyone knew that it wasn't just the city being flooded, that all the small towns and villages where everyone is experiencing the same thing, to bring a sense of camaraderie and connection of why we would jointly tackle that. You develop platforms then across the river basin to do analytics of why that's occurring and what could be done. And then we began to establish the right governance platforms, pulling together groups of people in, from different communities together to begin to talk about what could be done with funding available to put it together interventions that could reduce flooding over the long term. That body that came together that we helped to establish is now recognized by the city of Samarang and the national government. And the recommendations that those groups come together and put in place of what would actually reduce the flooding for them is acknowledged in the process of doing the budgets for both the city and the whole river basin. And so the reason I find this to be exciting is that we're not talking by a community by community approach, but we're actually talking about a holistic design to reduce a, a problem that an entire river basin has to deal with. That, to me, is, is innovative in its scale and its replicability to other places that are flooding. Um, and it's more sustainable in the long run. It means that a group like Mercy Corps isn't going to come back to the same place year after year after year after year to help with the impacts of flooding, if we can address those root causes of those challenges. So those three areas to me are absolutely fundamental. The agriculture and technology, working on disaster risk reduction in an innovative, scalable way, and working on climate finance. To me, if we don't get those things right in fragile places around the world, we're simply going to be stuck. And so that, that's, what, that's what I get, also get most excited about. So thanks.
Okay, let's go right here. Hi, it's really impressive the uh, work you've been doing. And I did notice uh, that you, one place had a solar panel for their phones, it looked like. Hmm. But I'm just wondering, are you taking into account the mitigation, i.e., we're not going to stop at 1.5 degrees? We're going to keep going. So are, yeah. you t are you working on agricultural techniques that both do sequestration as well as productivity and mm -hmm. things like encouraging people to use solar panels rather than fossil fuels or even burning their dung? <laughs> that, yeah. that, that generates uh, transmissions too. Yeah. Do you want me to answer just that one or are you going to do a couple of them, Tim? All right, I'll, I'll answer quickly. Um, yeah, we have a whole portfolio of programs um, that f focus on sustainable access to, to access to sustainable energy, um, all focused on helping nations develop in sort of on a, what we call like a low carbon trajectory, right? Ensure that we're not just dealing with adaptation, but we're taking into account that we also have to reduce greenhouse gases. We do try to be cognizant of the fact that these countries, for the most part, are not the major emitters and that we should not be, we have to balance the need to help develop economies and help livelihoods that desperately need help, while also acknowledging that climate piece, but it's, it's a tough trade-off sometimes. So we have to be cognizant of that. But we do have a lot of work on extending uh, energy through mini-grids, work on solar. We're now working pretty heavily with partners on actually how to uh, bring solar and other forms of sustainable energy into big camps of refugees and migrants, because those places start off short term and end up being potentially decade long places where people are living. And so if we can reduce the use of diesel generators that are used for decades, it's a huge gap in emissions as a result. So we are. And then the resilient ag approach that we use is all focused on ecosystem health and preventing further deforestation. And in fact, hopefully to build biodiversity up, you actually want to reforest these places, which helps with carbon sequestration for sure. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Could you address uh, the controversy of multinational seed companies and perhaps worsening the plight of the small farmer? Multinational seed companies? Uh, like Mon Monsanto. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am not the expert on multinational seed com uh, companies at all. So I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to provide you with like uh, with an explanation on that or, or something. Um, I do know there's a lot of work to do by, those, by many companies that figure like what will work in terms of climate resilient seed varietals. Um, but I, you know, I, to some degree, I think many farmers actually already know the types of things that are needed. Um, and it's not about developing new seed varietals, it's by taking into account older techniques um, that haven't been utilized in some time or need to be updated in small ways. The role of multinational seed developers in that, I don't think Mercy Corps actually gets too involved in that. We don't work with those companies in, in a major way that I'm aware of. So sorry, I can't really comment too much on it, but I do know it's a major issue. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Um, climate change denial is a major issue, at least at a governmental level here. Mm -hmm. Um, Australia, and I guess even Brazil, where Mercy Corps has, has boots on the ground. Is that um, an issue at the governmental level at any of your locations? And if so, okay, I guess I've got my answer. <laughs> so so that, there they, it's, it's, it's acknowledged. And, 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 and the government um, uh, cooperates with you in, 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 in this regard. Yes. 100%, absolutely, across the board, for sure. Um, most of the work we do would not be, none of the work we would do be, would be possible without government partner and agreement in what we're doing. If we're doing a program in, for example, we just kicked off some work in Sudan that has a climate change element. We, the first order of business when we realized we were getting this funding was to make sure that the government of Sudan knew exactly what all of our plans and things were. Um, and when we're, when we're going out to scope a program, um, I did this about a year ago. I was in Burkina Faso and Niger, and we were scoping out what we were going to do in relation to a USAID grant that we were going to apply for. And our first thing was to go around and talk to all government officials about what was needed. And there, 
If you're talking about climate change, you're very much welcome in that door to figure out solutions. There is no denial because they're experiencing the impacts more than anyone else. Thank you very much. For your, mostly what I hear about climate change is reducing emissions yeah. and on a big macro level. And I'm wondering what you're doing, and you basically you're from the bottom up instead of the top down, and what you're doing, and I, which I hear very little about, is it much harder to get funding then? Um, no, it's, I wouldn't say it's harder to get funding. It's been, a, it's been an evolution for the world of climate change adaptation or climate resilience. Initially, all the funding came from mitigation. And then a couple of years ago at these big international climate workshops that all the governing nations, come, they're called COPs, Climate Conference of the Parties. It's like a, um, they're big policy events, presidents, and all the high-level important people from countries go basically and hammer out what's going to be done. And there was a push a number of years ago to amplify the amount of funding and attention on adaptation. And it was a grassroots effort by organizations, by NGOs like us, scientific organizations, local organizations that said it's not enough to reduce um, the impact. It's not enough to focus just on mitigation, but we also have to acknowledge that climate change is already happening and already impacting. And if we don't fund this um, now, then we're gonna all end up in a lot of trouble. And that's where that big, gross graphic that I showed um, is that all of that is in response to those discussions and negotiations. Uh, actually, I think that you're getting into, or my question was, I mean, I could walk away from here with that 11% in my mind and think that that meant tremendous inefficiencies in delivering. Mm -hmm. However, are we really looking at multiple priorities, mitigation versus adaptation, and that if you were taking all of the high priorities and saying, where's the money going, 11% would disappear. Can you, can you say that one more time? I think in I other that. words, are we just looking at 11% as what's getting to adaptation? And I think that's kind of what you suggested, oh. and that other priorities are being funded on top of that. No, that, that's climate finance in general. So climate finance covers both mitigation and adaptation at those local levels. So that is not just for adaptation alone. It's 11% across the board from dedicated climate funds is reaching the ground. Yeah, I mean, that just seems incredible, and there's got to be something more in that story. I'm not going to walk away thinking 11%. God, what an inefficiency in this whole system of bureaucracy. There's got to be more than that. Unfortunately, it, honestly, it's, it's not like, so I, I can tell you, one of the first things I did in grad school was I was put on a project that looked at what was called uh, the Kyoto Protocol at the time, and it was like the big international climate policy that preceded the, the, the Paris Climate Accord. That, that was more recent. And in there, there was a mechanism in there called the Clean Development Mechanism. And it was supposed to be a mechanism for national governments to apply for funding to help other countries offset their greenhouse gases, right? We did a review, we were tasked for UNEP in grad school as like consultants to them to look at the costs of a country like Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, Niger, to be able to go through the process to, to get funding for that work. And it was impossible. It was years of work um, and bureaucracy and expensive funding for assessments and things that needed to be done. And we just couldn't see how it was possibly going to happen. So we, our job was to make recommendations to them on how we would deuce, reduce the cost of, of playing in that game. And you're still seeing, you're still seeing it. The Green Climate Fund, uh, World Wildlife Fund right now, um, I talked to my colleagues the other week, they submitted an application for a project uh, two years ago, and it still hasn't been, still hasn't hit the ground, the money for that. It was funded, but money still hasn't hit the ground. So it's a challenge. You, you've, addressed, you've addressed a very important topic, um, but in the development field, um, climate change is now the fad, I don't mean that in a bad way, forgetting funds for national governments for getting funds. You mentioned Kenya as sort of a success story, working through the county to the national government, um, but Kenya, I think, still remains one of the most corrupt governments on earth. So I'm, I, the simple question is, how are you building in the good governance protection from corruption into your activities? It's a good question. Um, it is a challenge. 
and that is one of the reasons that you have, even of that, that depressing 11% number, I mentioned earlier that a, most of that 11% isn't going to many of the most challenging countries to work in, partially because of, um, of corruption, partially because of high risk of that money actually being used well and being able to show a return on investment of those funds, which you know, countries like the US have to show. USAID has to justify the use of its funding to Congress and show a return on investment. Um, so that can, be, that can be challenging. Mercy Corps has approaches uh, around good governance that, that we use um, at the sort of community to sub-national level. Um, that doesn't get us to the, the national level. Um, in some cases, we, we do work with those entities and we're increasingly working with national institutions. Um, and you, it's just the reality of the places we work. We have to deal with it sometimes. Um, it doesn't mean that corruption doesn't happen with, with the climate funds themselves, but there are also certain stipulations that governments need to adhere to, whether or not that fund is even gonna work with them. So if, for example, if one of those acronyms in one of those boxes, one of those banks wanted to work with Kenya, I imagine some of them will not, but they might work with another country. They might have Kenya on their list, but it's not prioritized for immediate investment because of the certain risk with corruption that they would note. So they might fund Uganda or somewhere else that hasn't shown similar levels of corruption, for example. So that can also, what you just said is actually uh, another barrier, but clearly Kenya got money from someone, one of those boxes who had relatively low standards on the corruption scale. So several large companies have recently began not only trying to reduce their carbon emissions, but also taking carbon out of the air and out of the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, does the Mercy Corps have plans to sort of follow suit and go what would essentially be carbon negative? As, a, as an institution or in, or work, or are you talking about while working with the communities that, that we work with? Either or. Okay, sure, yeah. So it's, it's, it's similar to the, the, the question where I was asked initially. So, like I said earlier, we do invest in strategies that help, that have emission reduction benefits. And it can either be through reducing the burning of, of timber and dung and other things, um, or increasing what are called carbon sinks, help things that, forests that suck up carbon dioxide. And so we do that in the field. As an institution, um, we're looking at a number of things. So we actually have pilots going on right now so most of the development world needs really remote places. The historical way that you get energy in an office is by diesel generator. That's just how it's worked for many years. It's expensive, it's dirty, it's time consuming to haul fuel. What we've begun to invest in is solar, solar panels and figuring out how to build the cost of solar panels into the grants we're getting to support all of that. So we have a couple of country offices now that are, that are doing that and trying to figure out the best way of doing it. Um, in terms of our sort of humanitarian work, as well, I mentioned that we're partnering with a number of other technical institutions to figure out how to set up mini grids in these camps so that as our operations and as their daily lives continue to go on, we're not also doing those diesel generators. And then as sort of global institution-wise, we've actually just started a process to look at our global carbon emissions as an agency and we're in the midst right now of actually pricing out different plan options for how to drastically reduce our, our carbon dioxide. Um, I don't know if you can go carbon negative, and some of our, frankly, some of our discussions are, does that last little bit matter for the amount of money you have to pour into it for that tiny little bit? But the idea is, hopefully, that we make, we're able as an institution to make an investment in a way that, through creative ways, that we're able to actually reduce our carbon footprint by quite a lot. And we're looking at everything from like going purely vegetarian in the office to reducing our travel, to carbon offsets, a um, whole host of different things are on the table at the moment. Yeah. Um, great questions. I'm sorry that we are out of time. If, if you look right behind Elliot, um, wavelength times frequency equals speed of light, and an hour goes by so quickly with all of you. Um, I want to thank you for all your, your great questions. Um, join us next week again for more, more fun um, as I say every week to quote the great poet laureate, uh, Carol Burnett, I'm so glad we've had this time together. So, thanks.